Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. In honor of Women's History Month, I've been interviewing authors of books that highlight the women who flew for their countries during World War II. In my interview with Elizabeth Wien, we talked about the British Air Transport Auxiliary, the Nazi test pilots, and the Russian Night Witches. Sarah Byrne Rickman talked with me about the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron and the Women Air Service Pilots. And then I had the opportunity to talk with Rocky Ramsey about her sister-in-law, Wasp Nadine Ramsey. I've known my guest today for over 20 years through a Coast Guard connection. And before I introduce her as a retired Coast Guard officer and pilot, I wanted to take the opportunity as I'm wrapping up Women's History Month to highlight a lesser known group of women who served their country during World War II. The SPARs were the Women's Coast Guard Auxiliary. SPAR has a double meaning. It's an acronym for Semper Paratus, Always Ready, which is the Coast Guard's motto. And SPAR is also a nautical term referring to a support on a ship for a sail, such as a mast or a yard arm. Well, my grandmother served as a SPAR during World War II. And if you're watching on video, you can see her in uniform in the photo um, on the dresser behind me. She served at the Marine Safety Office in Galveston, and my grandfather went down to register his boat and that's how they met. So I carried on a legacy of women's service in the Coast Guard and I'm very proud to say that I also have a son who serves now. While she wasn't a pilot, I wanted to take the opportunity to honor her in the context of the women who served their countries during World War II. My guest today has been an award-winning author and professional journalist for over two decades and has served as managing editor of several newspapers around the country. Her articles have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Russian Life, Flight Journal, and World War II Quarterly, among many others. And she's been interviewed by the BBC, National Public Radio, Voice of America, and other prestigious broadcasts. For her first book, The Marines of Operation Iraqi Freedom, she drew on her experiences accompanying the US Army's 3rd Infantry Division to the Persian Gulf during Operation Desert Thunder in 1998, as the managing editor of the Georgia Guardian. She served on the board of the National Women's Air Service Pilots World War II Museum in Sweetwater, Texas from 2009 to 2015. In her comparative study, Flying for Her Country, the American and Soviet Women Pilots of World War II, the first study of its kind, she weaves together the threads of both the Russian Night Witches and the Wasp. Amy Goodpaster Streeby, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm so excited about this. So we met, I want to say about 20 years ago when I was stationed as a pilot at Coast Guard Air Station San Francisco and your husband was working there as an aviation survival technician, which are the rescue swimmers who jump out of the back of the helicopter. And I was basically his ambulance driver to get him to a bunch of SAR cases, some of, the, some of <laughs> which we have some funny stories about. But you and I met then and what I remember from my first meeting of you is that you were, you had, a, you were having babies then. And, oh, yes. <laughs> and I think you were in your master's program. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I was actually in graduate school um, while I was pregnant with my, with my daughter, Abby. Um, so yeah, I was, I was doing graduate school and writing my thesis and doing all that kind of fun stuff. And so does, did your thesis tie into this book? It did actually, yes. It was, um, it was actually my book. So it started off as my thesis, my master's thesis. And um, I had decided to do, my, my degree was in modern European history. So I needed to do a subject that was uh, European based. Uh, and I was originally gonna do my thesis on the Soviet air women of World War II. But then I realized in order to do full justice to the subject and to add something to the scholarly research at the time, that I would probably have to go to Russia and, and go to Moscow and go to the archives and really dig deeper than a lot of, you know, what was out there already, which really wasn't a lot. Um, as you probably discovered, just looking through a lot of the authors and literature, there's more now since my book came out, but 
um, but it really wasn't a lot. There really aren't a lot of historians that are tackling the, the Soviet air women of World War II. So I was, um, so I was originally thinking about doing it about, about them um, exclusively. But then actually I, I spoke with um, Dr. Pennington, Dr. Raina Pennington, who is one of um, the scholars of the, of the Russian flyers. And I kind of gave her, you know, my dilemma of what, you know, was going on and said, I'd like to do it on the Soviet women, but, you know, maybe I, you know, don't have enough. And so I told her about the WASP and how I was really interested in the WASP and kind of tying them into my research as well. And so she suggested, well, why don't you do a comparative study? Because, you know, it hasn't really been done. And um, it would be interesting to kind of tie the American side to the Russian side. And so I thought that was a good idea. And initially I was a little concerned because I thought, well, am I just comparing apples to oranges? You know, is it just because they're women and they're pilots? Is that the only similarities that they're going to have? Obviously they're going to have differences in political ideology and that kind of thing. But, um, but you know, the more and more I got into the research, the more I, I, I really was surprised to find how many similarities I found more than I actually thought that I would in my research. I'm really interested to know what, like, what was the impetus behind this? What was your background before you started your master's program that led you to be interested in the, in these pilots, either one of them? Well, my background is in journalism. So I worked as manager editor for, for several newspapers around the country. Also, um, I've written several articles in national and international publications. So my, my, my background really comes back from more of the journalism writing side of it. And while I was in graduate school for history, I took a women's history class, which I really loved. And one of our assignments, we had to, you know, obviously write a big research paper and our professor gave us a list of some possible topics. One of the topics was the Soviet women combat pilots of World War II. And of course, like most people, I just looked at it and said, what? <laughs> like women, like Soviet women, like flew combat missions in World War II. And I was like, oh my gosh, I never heard of that. So I had some background in history in terms of Imperial Russia. I had a lot of interest in like the Romanovs and um, Russian history up until the revolution, but I'd never really ventured into the Soviet period of, of you know, Russian history. So that was kind of different for me, but it was, it was, it was really, it was really exciting to kind of get that ball rolling in terms of the more more I started like reading books and started doing the research and I love doing research and for me the research is a lot more fun than the writing the writing is a lot harder <laughs> which probably a lot of writers will probably say thing you know it's like it's yeah. fun to get everything together and just organize your your materials and how you're going to you know lay it all out which is similar to like writing an article as a journalist I think too but was what was crazy is that really my book in a lot of ways actually signifies kind of the beginning of my research more than the culmination of my research, which is kind of frustrating in some ways because after my book came out is really when I got to know more of the WASP, I got to meet them. Um, I was you know, obviously very fortunate and blessed to, to count many of them as my friends. And so there's so many things I would have loved to have been able to put into my book after it was published, but Unfortunately, you can't do that. So, <laughs> um, but that was, and then of course, I also in 2007, I was fortunate to be invited to Avia Trista, which is a Russian women's international uh, conference in Moscow. And there I got to uh, meet, you know, crazy enough, I was able to meet a lot of the Russian uh, women pilots who I talk about in my book including um, Nadezhda Popova, who is probably the most famous of the night witches. I met her really just by chance. We went to a concert at the Kremlin. And after the concert, like, we noticed that there was all these people that were kind of gathered around. Like there were some like TV reporters and, you know, the, you know, this older woman sitting down and they were just like, who is that? And it was just like, oh, you know, <laughs> and for us, it's like, you know, us, because I was with a group of 99, so women pilots. And we were just like, oh, Nadia Mova, you know, it's like she's just a rock star. So we were That's super so excited great. to meet her. And um, so, you know, to be able to, to meet not only the WASP, but also the Soviet Air Women too, you know, not many 
not many historians get to actually meet their subjects. So I was incredibly lucky in that regard. And then I saw that you were on the board uh, of the WASP World War II Museum is that in Sweetwater. Yes, yeah, for several years I was. Tell me I about was, that. Uh, how did there. what led you to that? Was it the book itself, or how did you get involved? Uh, and what did you, you do know, on the board? I, I think so. I think it, I was also just it was just kind of more of an advisory type of capacity. But I did get to. I was fortunate enough to um, finally it took me a couple of years, but I, I did make it to Avenger Field. Um, where the National Wasp Museum is located in um, Sweetwater, Texas. And um, it's, uh, it, you know, they had every year on Memorial Day, they would hold, a, you know, have a homecoming for the wasp. And it was really wonderful to be able to see, you know, a lot of the women come back and, and uh, some of them for the first time, some of them like they would come every year, but, you know, some of them hadn't been back since World War II and they were training. And so that was really exciting to be able to, you know, to, to be able to be there with them and, and just to see kind of what it was like to, you know, to in West Texas where there, the sky is very big and <laughs> it's a great place to, to fly, I'm sure, because there isn't a whole lot out there even, <laughs> even today. Even now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was really nice to be able to, you know, just meeting the people. You know, I think that's been one of the joys of writing this book and getting it out to people. It's just that the people that I've been able to meet, whether it, you know, to be the, you know, the women pilots themselves, but, but also just the, the, just, just the people in the museums that I've met, the people, um, you know, other pilots, other authors, uh, you know, just, it's just really, it really extended the life of, um, of my book and, and just really, you know, gave me a better appreciation for for World War II and just the the you know the really the, the sacrifices and the accomplishments that that women um, did during during the war. So that was that's that's been really special. So you mentioned earlier that you uh, you knew there would be differences between um, the two, the Soviet women and the U.S. women, and you were wondering how many similarities there might be. I'd, I'd love to know, like, what were the differences that surprised you or, or what did you go in expecting um, maybe that wasn't true? And then also, you know, what were the simil similarities that surprised you in your research? Well, I think, well, the similarities were definitely, which I talk a lot about the kind of the gender issues in, in, in the book, about the discrimination of um, the women, because even, you know, this is the first time um, you know, in a large capacity, the, the, the Russian women have flown, especially, you know, at that kind of um, extent, because, you know, the, in, in Russia at that time, because of the war, they needed as many, you know, pilots as possible. And so I think that the, the government wasn't particularly thrilled to have like women flying just because it, you know, being a very patriarchal kind of society, it was kind of deemed as like, oh, you must be really desperate, you know, if you're sending out your girls to be killed. Um, but Stalin was actually pretty supportive of it. And he and Marina Raskova, who who started the, the, the three women's regiments, um, you know, seemed to be very supportive of, of the endeavor. And I think there were so many, just like with the, with the American women, there were so many women who were already a pilots who really wanted to do their part. In fact, it was funny. I was, I was reading just a little bit of my book the other night, and I remember the part where it said in, in the Soviet Union, because so many women had gotten their pilot's license in the 30s, and, and a lot of the um, had that opportunity to, to fly, and they, they were so desperate to, to help in the war effort that they were stealing aircraft to go to the front. <laughs> so, and so finally, I guess, I guess, you know, Marina Raskova and Stalin, they realized that like, okay, maybe we need to do something a little bit more organized, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> so we're not having these women steal planes and, you know, fighting, um, you know, fighting against the Germans. So I think with that, in terms of like the gender issues that, you know, there were obviously, even though the Soviets kind of boasted their um, equality for women. It was still like very unusual for, you know, women to be working in this capacity. 
And of the three regiments, and I know you've probably talked in other interviews about just the kind of specifics of the regiments, but there were three regiments. There were the 586th, which was the, the fighter regiment, and they flew mainly the Yak ones. And then there was the 587th, which were the, um, the dive bombers, and they flew the PE-2s. And then the 588th, which is probably the most well-known in the United States, um, which was the Night Bomber Regiment, which was nicknamed by the Germans, the Nachthexen or Night Witches. And then they were so successful that they actually were awarded later in the war um, the designation of the 46th Guards Regiment. So they actually have two names. They, had, they were started off as the 588th and then they became the 46th Guards. And they were the only regiment in the war to remain exclusively female. So the other two regiments did have some men that were um, that were part of the of the aviation regiment. Um, so they were, you know, they were the ones that were, um, and they flew the PO twos, which was kind of like the, you know, <laughs> the world the World War One era type of planes. People think of like the the canvas and the the wood biplanes. So. Um, you know, it, it, it's always interesting to hear about, you know, when people realize that they, these women flew this, you know, against the Luftwaffe, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy, um, but they were very successful and they did an awesome job. But, but obviously, you know, there were, there were men that were very surprised, you know, I think with the WASP, was, WASP especially, um, you know, they would be stationed at some of these air bases that obviously had men in there. And a lot of the men, because Jackie Cochran, the director of the WASP made the program so secret that a lot of the men, even on the base, weren't aware that there were women pilots. And so, you know, the younger ones typically like tend to be a little bit more receptive and open to it. But some of the, you know, I read accounts where a lot of the older pilots were just like flat out not willing to like, I'm not going to fly with this woman, you know, and a lot of them got transferred, you know, to another base or were pretty hostile. So, you know, it was tough. Like I, you know, like, like there was no, there's no women's restrooms, you know, on air bases, you know, and of course the, the Soviet and there was another thing that they had in common is they didn't really have their own fitted flight suits. <laughs> so the, the WASP called theirs zoot suits. And the Soviet air women too, you can see pictures of them in these like really, you know, very oversized, um, you know, flight suits that were obviously created for men. So, you know, so there was, there was the prejudice and then there was also just the, the kind of reality, I guess, of, you know, when you are stepping up into a role that's, that's, that's not normal in society that hasn't really been done. So there's going to be some difficulties and some, some things and, and some things, you know, that end up kind of being, I guess, funny in some ways. Like there were some women, some wasps who were just, you know, just thought it was funny when the men would get all uppity about, about them being there. And they're just like, oh, we, we just thought it was kind of, you know, we just thought it was just kind of funny, you know, because I think I'm sure that they kind of expected it that this was gonna, this was gonna happen. But um, but they, you know, they knew they could fly the planes just as well. And a lot of the women were actually instructor pilots before they became wasps. So a lot of them were had way, you know, way more hours in the cockpit than, you know, the men, especially the ones that they were training. Um, so they were, they were very, uh, very capable, um, you know, them and the, of course, Soviet air women in there. So, so I think in terms of, um, so in terms of being, you know, the being women, obviously they had that kind of connection um, of, of being kind of pioneers in aviation. And so they had that. And then, um, you know, in terms of the differences, I think obviously the clearest, the, the most, you know, difference is obviously that, that the WASP did not fly combat. The women, you know, even though the WASP had 38 women who lost their lives, um, even though they didn't fly combat, but they still with with mishaps and training accidents, you know, so they they did lose people, even though, well, you know, they didn't didn't fly in combat. Um, so, yeah, so obviously the, the, the Russian women did have that uh, kind of reality when they when they flew, they, you know, and they lost a lot of of their sister pilots, you know, they lost a lot of a lot of, um, of their friends. And so being so young and 
that must have been a really difficult thing. And and but you know, like I said, that the the women, the Russian and the American women would be able to have that in common. Um, and one thing I do want to add is that it was kind of cool is that that a group of WASP actually flew to Moscow. I think it was it. I think it was in like the seventies, I believe. And so they actually got to meet, and a lot of them corresponded with each other. So they, they, there were rumors that that they each existed during the war, but that don't, as as far as I know, I don't think any of them actually met during the war, but after the war that they did. And uh, so that's you know that's it's kind of cool that they that they had that connection to one another. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um, and that kind of leads me to one of my favorite chapters of the book is where you're talking about the post-war both the post-war treatment of the, the women in both countries and how they were received immediately and, and the legacy that was passed on. Um, and one of the things that, that really struck me when I was reading that, rereading that recently was just the fact that, you know, it, as you know, a child of the seventies, <laughs> I was born in the seventies, World War II, was kind of an abstraction to me. You know, I, I'm not an historian, so I haven't spent a lot of mind space in that era. But through my understanding of aviation and, and my own experience in aviation, and also like actually getting to meet some of the WASP and some of some of the Russian women who came to the conferences, um, the Women in Aviation International conferences, and just watching that timeline, and especially the way that you lay it out about how they were having their 30th anniversary at the time that the first women were being integrated into the service academies and just to kind of see and and then now I'm friends who with women who were on the first wave of those women in service academies just to see how closely I am in that history like the, in that trajectory like I'm still in it and then you talk about uniforms not fitting and bases not having bathrooms well guess what <laughs> even in 1991 and 92 um yes still dealing yes. with that so, takes a long yeah. time doesn't it <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean what were your impressions about the post-war treatment on both sides uh, i mean we can read it in the book but from yeah yeah well and, that, and that's and that's kind of partly where there's similarities and there's and there's some differences as well but um, now, with a, with American with the WASP, they unfortunately were disbanded before the end of the war, which was very um, you know very disappointing for the WASP. And um, you know all they wanted to do was serve serve their country, and there was still a need for them. Um, even though a lot of the a lot of the men were returning from overseas towards the end of the war, so there was fear that the men would go into like the walking army and not you know not be able to get back their their flying jobs. So unfortunately, there was this big like campaign that was uh, kind of uh, done in the in the press, um, and that really, uh, in fact, I remember reading a lot of those articles that were written during that time, and oh, it's just it's really very frustrating to read. You know, of course, all the women are are called girls, <laughs> right? In the 1940s, you know, this girl pilot, and it always like started off like what they look like, and you know, it's just like oh man. Um, but yeah, they, they basically did kind of this really damaging campaign, uh, against the WASP, um, that was basically kind of telling the general public who, you know, under, you gotta understand the general public really had no idea for the most part that there were women who were risking their lives and, you know, and, and flying these planes from manufacturer to air base and tow targets. And, you know, they were, they were, you know, doing everything that a man was doing except for flying in combat. But because Jackie Cochran had such a tight lid on the, the program, because she was so afraid that, you know, something would happen that it would, you know, it would, they would just have an excuse to shut it down, that the women, like, were not allowed to be interviewed, they were not allowed to really talk about, you know, their service, um, you know, at that time. So all these untruths were being circulated in the media and even through Congress and, it was just very frustrating for the women not being able to speak for themselves. So I guess it wasn't really that big of a surprise when legislation was actually, because Jackie Cochran was hoping to get the um, service militarized because um, most of the women's auxiliaries, you know, in the United States at that time were, were militarized. So meaning that they were considered full-fledged members of the military. 
but the wasps were in this weird kind of quasi military um, category where they wore uniforms, they saluted, they did all the kind of things that you would if you were in the military, but without the benefits, you know, there's a lot of um, sad stories about the women that were killed during the war. The government did not pay for them to um, get, you know, for their funerals, to, to even to have their bodies shipped back to their families. A lot of the wasp had to pitch in money um, and, and use a company, the, the bodies, you know, a friend would company the bodies back to their hometown or with their families. And you know, no flags draped on their, on their coffin, um, you know, no GI Bill, no, you know, um, none of that, none of those kind of things that they were able to do right after the war. So that was, so that was, that was really tough. So the, the being disbanded and it was in December of 19, um, 1944. And so that was, that was really disheartening for the wasps. So they were basically said, okay, well, thanks Thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> you know, thanks for your time, but you know, now we're bringing the men in, so you guys can all go home and you know start start families and things. So that was tough. And now the, the Soviet women, it was a little bit different. I mean, they did obviously go to the end of the war, and they were they were honored. I mean, as as most you know, obviously of all the the male um, regiments and things were too, they were given medals. Um, but you know. It was funny. It's really interesting is because I, I remember um, after speaking to some of the of the Russian women when I was in Moscow and also just reading about what they said in their in their memoirs, too. But it's such a difference. This is only one of the differences is that where, where the American women were so eager to like a lot of them, you know, wanted to stay in the, in the military. A lot of them wanted to continue flying and a lot of them did continue flying. Maybe it was. Um, later on, maybe it was commercial flying, which which did take a while because initially, of course, they just they you know the only thing they were, were qualified for, crazy enough, was like a flight attendant, <laughs> you know, even though they could easily fly the plane. Right. Um, but yeah, it took a, it took a while for for uh, the American women to be able to do that. But they you know a lot of them had their own planes, a lot of them flew around the around the world, and it was really um, you know really 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 great to see. And some of them did you know stay in in the in the military, but for the most part, it was kind of like okay, you've done your thing. We're going back to the way things were, you know. So that was that was really tough. Now the Soviet air women, I remember reading that. A lot of them were very grateful that they didn't, but that it was kind of like it was done. Like it, like we did, you know, we did this for our country, but now, you know, now we're happy that we don't have to do it anymore. Like they didn't really want to necessarily go back and do this again. Of course, granted, you know, I'm sure a lot of them had PTSD. A lot of them, you yeah, know, I was wondering if that was issues in the context of sort of the operating conditions that they were in. Yeah, right, right. It was That's obviously very difficult for them too, and they were young, and you know, they probably wanted, you know, they probably wanted to get on with their lives, and having seen so many of their friends and their fellow countrymen being killed, and 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 you know so many horrible things that we can't even imagine here in the United States. Um, so it was, it was interesting, it was a very different perspective. A lot of them, you know, and, and there probably were ones who maybe wa who wanted to continue flying, but, but for the most part, for most of them I've read, but the, the Russians were just kind of glad to be like, you know, like we're kind of, we're glad it's over. We did, we did our part, we're proud of what we did, but we kind of want to, you know, go on and do something else and, and not experience those hardships like they did, you know, understandably. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned in your book, um, and you, this was published over 10 years ago, you mentioned that really uh, the military in Russia has not integrated women in the same way that the United States has. No, no. In fact, I think when my, my book was published, I remember doing some research where there was a woman who was um, it, it was, it was trained to be like a, a fighter pilot, I believe. And, but she was really an anomaly and there really wasn't a lot of support for her. And, um, yeah, unfortunately it just really, the, the climate is kind of like, you know, we've got men pilots, you know, we don't, we don't really like, which is, it was, you know, very frustrating, especially with the history of what women have contributed in the Soviet Union. 
um, and not just not just pilots. I mean, snipers, and you know, I mean, there's there's just, you know, they, they basically did everything that the men did in in World War II. So, so yeah, it is unfortunate. And, and as far as I know, and like I haven't done a lot of research since then, but um, my my guess is just probably yeah, there hasn't been a lot of um, openness towards women in in the military and especially in aviation. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I would love to hear from the book. Do you want to do a reading or two? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Let's see. Well, I think I'm going to start off with something that I read. I, I used to uh, go around to quite a few like air museums and different museums around the country, um, giving my talk on my book. Obviously, it's been a few years since I've done that, but one of the, one of the um, uh, little readings I do from the wasp that's always kind of an interesting one that kind of just pinpoints the the uh, unusualness of of women flying in a military capacity in the United States by the time the wasp graduated and were sent to their respective air bases for duty they quickly became accustomed to the dumbfounded and unbelieving reactions they received from male pilots and air personnel as the following story, recounted by Wasp Carol Fillmore illustrates, many people were not even aware of the women pilot's existence. The women's presence in the air oftentimes took the men in the control tower completely by surprise. On her way to Newark to deliver a P-51 Mustang, Fillmore flew from Long Beach to Athens, Georgia, where she ran out of daylight. She tuned in the Athens tower and called for landing instructions, but no one answered. She called the tower again, but still no response. In minutes, she was directly over the field. She began to circle and ask for a radio check. Suddenly, an exasperated voice could be heard in her earphones. Will the woman who was calling please stay off the air? We're trying to bring in a P-51. Fillmore looked around in the growing dust for the other Mustang. Seeing none, she called in again for landing clearance. Will the lady who's trying to get in please stay off the air, shouted the tower. We are trying to make contact with the P-51. Fillmore was beginning to feel weary from her long day in the air and her patience was running out. Finally, she pressed the button on the stick activating her throat mic. For your information, the lady who is on the air is in the P-51, she said. And without waiting for an answer, turned on final approach and headed straight down the runway at 120 miles an hour. The radio suddenly came alive. Yeah, man, I hear you, I hear you. Did you see the light? You're coming in fine, just great. Fillmore made a perfect landing. Ah, that was beautiful, the startled man in the tower called out. <laughs> oh, so many that. things I could say to that. <laughs> I will keep them to myself. <laughs> That's great, good for her. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, that was funny. I just, yeah, I thought that, that was, uh, I'm sure that happened quite a bit too. Cause it's like oh, yeah. you know, hearing that like, you know, female voice, it's like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> So let's see. So there's two two things I like to read from the Soviet side. Um, one of them is by Nadezhda Popova, who um, who I mentioned earlier is probably one of the most well known of the night witches. Um, she's featured quite a bit in my book, and there's also um, been you know a lot. Of, she does a lot of interviews. She unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but she you know would be kind of like the spokeswoman um, of the night witches and. So this kind of talks about her, one of her first like times going up in the air and um, experiencing combat and kind of what that, what that feels like. The women flyers were anxious to test their training in action and no pilot could, could forget her first encounter with the enemy. Nadezhda Popova assigned to the 588th Night Bomber Aviation Regiment recalled her first combat mission near the Southern Front in the Ukraine. It was a very, very dark night. Not one small star could be seen. The sky was covered in cloud. It seemed that it was an abyss of darkness, pitch black. And when I got up in the air, I could see the front line marked by green, red, and white tracer lights, where skirmishes continued throughout the night. I followed the lights towards the accumulation of enemy troops. Suddenly, the plane in front of mine got caught in three and later five projector lights, which blind pilots. I watched them fall to the earth right in front of my eyes and saw the explosion of flames below. I flew towards the enemy line thinking I must help my friends. Irrational thoughts, I knew they were dead. 
We dropped the bombs on the dots of light below. They shot at us and I circled round and flew back towards the base. When I landed, I could see they already knew. I was ordered to fly another mission immediately. It was the best thing to keep me from thinking about it. Yeah, you might wanna go home after those experiences, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? You just have to like, fly immediately after or else, you know, the more you think about it. Oh, yeah. The you're more you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like going home after the war, after those oh, experiences. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you think about it too. I mean, you know, and I think about a lot, a lot about World War II and, and the male pilots too, obviously. Um, you know, it, it's, it must have been so hard because nowadays we talk about PTSD and we talk about the traumas, even though it's still difficult, but, you know, nobody gets out of war scotch-free in terms of, you know, just, just, you know, having those experiences are, are so difficult emotionally and, uh, not just physically, but emotionally. And so I think about the women too, it must've been difficult because, you know, they're, experiencing things that most women typically don't and yeah they're not going to go you know, home and have people who can relate to it right right they're not going to have like right. a you know therapist there that they're going to be able to talk to and you know kind of help sort things out <laughs> so yeah. yeah um and then another another uh, reading i'd like to do is one about uh lydia um lily litvak who is pretty famous um she wasn't a night witch she actually flew fighters she was in the 586th regiment, but then also flew in a couple of the, of the male regiments as well. So this is just an experience that she had during the war that um, I always thought was very interesting. One of the best um, known Soviet woman pilots in the war who became famous for being a double ace was Lydia, nicknamed Lilia Litvak. A senior lieutenant, as well as a flight commander of the 73rd Guard Stalingrad Vienna Fighter Regiment 6th Fighter Division, 8th Air Army. She also served in the 586 as well as two other fighter regiments. Born August 18, 1921 in Moscow, Litvak learned to fly at a young age. It is fitting that her birthday falls on Air Fleet Day, the day Russia honors its air forces. Striking in appearance and small in stature, she made a powerful impression on everyone who came in contact with her. A lover of nature, she said to have decorated the inside of her cockpit with wildflowers found near the airfield, and legend has it that she painted a white lily on the fuselage of her aircraft. No one could have predicted this petite blonde pilot, she had to have the pedals of her plane adjusted so she could reach them, who liked to fashion colorful neck scarves out of parachutes, would prove to be such a deadly adversary in the skies. On September 13, 1942, Litvak would go down in history as the first woman in the world to shoot down an enemy aircraft. She downed two German fighters that day in an intense air battle over Stalingrad that involved a German ace named Erwin Meyer, who was a three-time recipient of the Iron Cross. He had scored his 11th victory three days earlier. Meyer was forced to bail out of his aircraft and once captured on the ground, he asked to meet the Russian ace who had shot down his plane. When the 21-year-old Litvak stood before him, he stared in amazement. In disbelief, he demanded proof that she had indeed been the pilot he had fought with. After Litvak described in detail their dogfight, which had been her first, Meyer was forced to believe her account. According to an article by Vladimir Belaikov, when, when Meyer had accepted the bitter truth, he knelt down beside her and ceremoniously offered her his Swiss made gold watch, a great luxury in Russia at that time. Litvak's response to the gesture was to say, I do not accept gifts from my enemies, after which she abruptly turned and walked away. For a pilot of her limited experience to achieve two kills in a single day, especially one involving a fighter ace, was an amazing accomplishment. Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she was, you know, she was, she was pretty amazing. And then there's also um, another pilot, Katerina Budnova, who, you know, it's funny, they, they, they kind of talk like who is the one who's considered like, who has, you know, the most kills of, you know, of women combat pilots. And Katerina Budnova, who also died during the war, um, like she, she, her and her and Lily lived back are kind of like neck and neck. So even though Lilia kind of gets more of the um, attention and, and the accolades, but um, I had to give a little 
give a little uh, <laughs> give a little wow. love to uh, Katja Budneva because she also, in fact, she flew with Lilia, um, but uh, she also was a really incredible fighter pilot. And the crazy thing too is that these these women are still considered like they. I don't think I don't think there's been any any women who have topped that. I mean, that those are still outstanding um, records that that they had in in the war. So. Um, so yeah, they were, they were pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, and you talked about the fact that they were well decorated and honored in their country, but it took us a lot longer to honor ours. And um, so the Congressional Gold Medal. medal. Yes, the Congressional, the congressional gold, medal. gold Medal didn't happen here until 2009, I think. Uh, March 10th, 2010. 2010. Yeah, 2010. I was I was uh, really uh, blessed to have gotten an invitation. I was there at the Capitol. When That's what I wanted to ask. Tell were. me about that. Tell yeah, me about that, that was that was an amazing experience, and um, you know, I was just so fortunate to be there and and you know to watch the women and you know so many of them. You know, unfortunately, we've lost so many of them just in the last decade. I guess since they, since they received the medal. So it's, it was really wonderful when I look back at the pictures and and see a lot of my friends that were there and just how proud that they were. I mean, it was a long time coming. It was a really long time coming, but um, I, I still remember like just how proud they were and, you know, they were with their families and, you know, it was just, it was a way for them to collectively come together and and just remember their experiences and, and to be recognized for them, which I, I thought was, which, which was really terrific. It is. It's amazing. And I feel grateful that I've, even though I only met a couple of them, I'm, I'm grateful I had the opportunity. And I, you know, even my daughter got to meet um, B. Heydu, who recently oh, good. passed away. He, he so. just recently passed away yeah. at like a hundred. So yeah, bless her heart. She, uh, she was going she strong was. to the very end. And she was lovely. <laughs> she was just lovely. So, oh yeah. And but she always wore her uniform too. I know. You know, a lot, know. several of them did. I mean, just the fact that they were able to fit, you know, into it. It was just, you know, after all those years, it was really impressive. I know life goals. If I can yes. still fit in my uniform when I'm, if I make it to 90, <laughs> right. in my uniform. Oh my goodness. Amy, this has been so great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk oh, about. Well, thank you for having me and for your interest in my book. Of so course, fun to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I, you know, I think in the context of the entire month, we have a really nice selection of, of fiction and nonfiction um, authors who are highlighting uh, these various women and celebrating them. So thank you, thank you so much for for the book that you wrote, for preserving this history, and for your involvement with them since, and and just you know, like you said, keeping the life of the book going. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you.